Father, we thank you again, O oh God, for the honor and privilege of being in, O oh God, assembled here, O oh God, oh God, to learn of your precious word. Father, we ask, O oh God, that your word would be, O oh God, a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, O oh God. Yea, O oh God, indeed, oh, open our minds, O oh God, to behold wonderful things from your law, O oh God. And Father, let it go beyond the intellect. Let it go down beyond the bone and marrow into the soul and the spirit, O oh God. Uh, cutting out those things which don't belong and put it in those things which do, O oh God. Yea, Father, even draw us nigh unto you, O oh God, as we study thy pre precious life-given word. Father, I thank you for those that are here in person, O oh God. I thank you for those that are watching online right now, God. I thank you for those that will watch later, O oh God. I pray that in every case, O oh God, your word does the work in the hearts of all of its hearers. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Father, touch me even now, O oh God. I will not rely on my own strength, O oh God, for I know in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, O oh God. Only speak through me about your word to this thy people, O oh God, with power and the unction of the Holy Ghost, falling on good soil. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Good evening to those of you online. Sorry about the picture, but I left my camera home, so I'm using the laptop camera. Uh, Matthew chapter... Ooh, why do I keep saying Matthew? Mark chapter 7. Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Uh, Mark chapter 7, verses 1 uh, through uh, 23. And let me get this up here. Okay. It reads, The Pharisees and some of the scribes gathered around him when they had come from Jerusalem. And had seen that some of his disciples were eating their bread with impure hands, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they carefully wash their hands, thus observing the traditions of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they cleanse themselves. And there are many other things which they have received in order to observe, such as the washing of cups and pitchers and copper pots. The Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? And he said to them, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain they, do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandments of God, you hold to the tradition of men. He was also saying to them, You are experts at setting aside the commandment of God in order to keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or his mother, Whatever I have that would help you is Corbin, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. After he called the crowd to him again, he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you, and understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. When he had left the crowd and entered the house, his disciples questioned him about the parable. And he said to them, Are you so lacking in understanding also? Do you not understand that whatever goes into the mouth, excuse me, whatever goes into the man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach, and is eliminated. Thus he declared all foods clean. And he was saying that which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. From, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of covetousness and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. The word of the Lord is already blessed. May you be blessed by the hearing and reading of God's word on today. Amen. Praise the Lord. We're going to be talking about as a theme or uh, the folly of <coughs> legalism. The folly of legalism. The folly? Yes, the folly. F-O-L-L-Y. The folly of legalism.
The main idea of the passage that I want to bring out today would be this, that the issue of hand washing reveals the folly of legalism and allows Jesus to point to the real issue of defiled human hearts. Again, the issue of hand washing reveals the folly of legalism and allows Jesus to point to the real issue of defiled human hearts. So, imagine a person who is faithful going to church. You see them every Sunday. They have their Bible in their hand, he or she. Um, he or she may even have a role in the church. They, he or she might sing in the choir or help count uh, the money or go out on mission trips. So this person is very faithful in sort of doing things and also in keeping the traditions of the churches. Or, or, or that is to say, you know, all that the church, that particular church, whatever church they attend, you know, does sort of as their form and practice, you'll find this individual doing. So by all outward appearances, you know, you, you would say, yeah, this is a faithful son or daughter of God. But imagine if you could look inside into that human heart, and we know that that's something only the uh, God can do. You you would see some uh, being surprised if you saw something black or or saw, saw darkness and saw evil and strife. You would immediately sort of be repulsed. You'd be like, "How can these things be?" When I see all of these sort of correct outward things being done. Things that are not wrong in and of themselves, things that could actually represent the fruit of a transformed heart. Uh, uh, but in this case, for this individual, would basically amount to a form of legalism. That is to say that they would be doing the right things, even as their heart is not actually committed towards God. Uh, you know, now, uh, now, of course, that's that's not something that most of us will can, can know or, or determine. You know, it, it may be sort of revealed uh, in time in interacting with the person. But the, I, I bring that up. I bring that example up because it 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 demonstrates some what we're going to be talking about today, which is where, you know, there is this outward appearance of of piety. Uh, uh, of holiness, of righteousness, but the, the, this person is a a faithful churchgoer who is faithfully on their way to hell because they actually don't serve the God uh, they claim to claim to be doing, and uh, this is what we're seeing here with these uh, fa uh, Pharisees and scribes who've come down from Jerusalem. Now, I think to properly sort of un unpack this, I, I need to talk about that phrase, tradition of the elders, or tradition of the elders, because we need to know a little bit about what that tradition was and how it came about <coughs> to, to understand, you know, Christ's response to it uh, and his sort of rejection of their uh, particular tradition in this case. Um, First thing we need to know is that these traditions are extra biblical. They are outside of scripture. You know, they are unscriptural in the sense that they don't derive or come from scripture. You know, a, a lot of these were probably added during the time of the exile or, you know, even after the exile when they were returning to the land. And they had a noble purpose, you know, to, you know, the people were driven into the exile because of their, you know, their uncleanness, their their idolatry, their their failure to worship uh, Yahweh and Him alone, uh, and so these traditions over the over the time, some, and some of them actually do postdate the New Testament, so they they come after the fact. But there are those that that go back before the New Testament. But in, in both cases, you know, they're they're either explicit interpretations of Scripture, that is to say. We are understanding this scripture a particular way or their implicit deviations. That is to say, 
der derivations. In other words, I understand there's no specific scripture that says I should be doing this. I should be uh, washing my hands before every meal. But you, you know what? I, I derive from uh, the scripture that the importance of cleanliness. I, and so I'm going to put this in uh, to place to ensure because if I don't break this rule, you know, I won't break the actual scripture. You know, that, that's where we, we see a lot of this come into uh, effect. And, and it had three clear functions, uh, the, these traditions of the elders, which, you know, even, you know, religious Jews today, Orthodox Jews today will, will claim to go all the way back to Moses. Uh, you know, Christians and uh, both Gentile and Jewish will say, no, that's actually not the case. But the purpose of these traditions were really threefold. One, to, and again, ensure holy living by the people. Um, you know, the, the, the idea here was to sort of, okay, we let's bring every area of life into co conformity with the Torah, into conformity with God's law. Um, that that way, uh, we can ensure that uh, again. Did it in the? I believe it's the Mishnah, it, which a, a, a collection of sort of Jewish oral traditions that were sort of written down. Uh, there's a section that says, uh, "Build a fence around Torah, create a situation, uh, create a fence." Well, because if you don't pass the fence, you you definitely won't violate what's what's in here. And we have to say that in and of itself, you know, these things aren't negative in and of themselves. And certainly the Pharisees and those who were before them who had developed a lot of this didn't think that they were violating or usurping scripture. You know, from their perspective, you know, uh, uh, again, you know, let's let's ensure that we don't transgress the law by creating something, a block in its place, uh, you know, an additional requirement not in there. But that ensures that we don't violate it. The uh, that was the first purpose. The the second purpose was to they wanted to sort of push back uh, against pagan inroads. So you know the Jewish people they were back in their land they were living, but you know they 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 endured times uh, when when we did our New Testament <coughs> introduction. I talked about Hellenization. This this idea of this, especially with Alexander the Great and those who came after him, really wanted to enforce, impose, push Greek culture into the empire. Uh, and these traditions were in part designed from present, uh, preventing the people from following the manners and customs of those around them. You know, in other words, to help them avoid those very things that got them sent into exile. And so these were visible, tangible things that could be done for the purpose of separating themselves from the wicked people that Yahweh, that the Lord is going to judge. Um, one pseudepigraphal book, so false writing. It, it's not actually, it wasn't actually written by the person that it was claimed, but it, it's called the Book of Jubilees. And um, so this was written in between the time of the Testaments. It, but it, it it captures what the idea here was. It says, And you also, my son Jacob, remember my words and keep the commandments of Abraham your father. Separate yourselves from the Gentiles and do not eat with them and do not perform deeds like theirs and do not become associates of theirs because their deeds are defiled and all their ways are contaminated and despicable and abominable. Uh, so, you know, the, you see there the idea that, you know, the, these traditions are designed to do just that. You know, it, it puts up a, 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 a wall, you know, us, them, inside, outside. Of course, that in the time of Christ became a problem because as one commentator noted, the, the, the outward signs of obedience in Jesus' day Circumcision, keeping the Sabbath, observing food laws, and washing hands became the badges that marked out the elect as those who were in, uh, end quote. It, you know, the, the problem when you have these type, th this system that can arise is that you have the in crowd. 
You don't do as we do. You don't speak as we speak. You don't act as we're supposed to act. Therefore, you're out there. No. You don't come to, ch when you come to church, you don't dress like we think that you should dress. And, you know, when, when the songs are being sung, you know, you, instead of just sit sitting there stiffly, I'm, I'm, I'm putting a character stiffly looking at the song sheet and singing. No, you're getting excited and, and, and doing all that. And we don't do that here. Um, for real, though, I, I heard a story where uh, growing up, I heard one pastor speak about how uh, he got in trouble. That there was a song being played and he was snap. He was either snapping. He was a, he was himself was a boy. He was either snapping his fingers or he was doing something, and he got scolded by a mother saying, "We don't do that." <laughs> oh, no, that that that's oh, that's I, I can I can appreciate the piety, but you're you're going way beyond uh, even what scripture would uh, would ask. Um, and the problem it can be that type of thing breeds and. Or it can bring about a self righteous sort of attitude or or mindset, yo, know, uh, and that again that causes you to push out the outsiders. And the last sort of you know goal or function of these traditions was to, and again th this is this is a noble thing to ensure that you know to facilitate prosperity in human affairs. So to make sure that all goes well. By ensuring that all things conform to Yahweh's standard, um, uh, in other words, you know, even every area of life, even minor ones, you know, that they have to be brought into uh, conformity or in line with some this, these created standards again, so that we can assure Yahweh's uh, blessing. Uh, here's the thing, though. It can get really intricate. Like so, the Mishnah, this uh, this collection of uh, Jewish traditions, um, it says, for example, that uh, what is this? The rules preserved in the Mishnah about washing hands, for example, specified the quantity of water required, the position of the hands, and the type of vessel to be used. So they are really detailed. Un frankly unnecessarily detailed uh but again if you if you do all of these right things you'll be okay you'll be good um and again i, I do want to stress you know man-made traditions in and of themselves don't necessarily conflict or contradict with what god has said in his word you know traditions can be uh god honoring I, I was thinking about one uh, this morning, uh, or as I was putting this together, like, I don't know, honestly, I, growing up, I just knew that when we took communion, uh, the guys were supposed to be in a black suit, and the ladies were supposed to be in a white dress. Um, to, I, to this day, I, I realized this morning, I never actually asked why that is. Um, there's no... There's no scripture that uh, requires that, you know, that's you to be sort of dressed in a certain way to take communion. Um, I I don't know if there's some type of typology behind it. I, I could probably uh, look it up. Uh, but at the same time, there's nothing sort of wrong with that. Uh, we are coming into the presence of the king and, you know, you know, perhaps it's a, a way of sort of in, ensuring that we you know, we come before the king in a way that recognizes that he is king. You know, so, so traditions can be God honoring. The, the problem arises when we make man-made traditions equal with scripture. So you don't just have to do what the Bible says. You've got to, you've got to do these other things. You, uh, you've got to understand the scripture the way that we do. And then you've got to do these actions that uh, are just as important, even though they're not directly said in Scripture. They're they're just as important, or you really can't be claiming to to know the Lord, yo. Know, in, in, in Christ times, you, you know, you, you know, if you're transgressing the tradition of the elders, you know, your heart could be as right uh, with God as can be. But if you're transgressing the condition of the elders, they would you're going to be on the outside. Mm -hmm. you know, that 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 that's not a person. Shun, shun that person 
And that actually goes against scripture. And, and, in fact, you know, later on, the Apostle Paul is going to uh, forbid such things. And Colossians 2.16, Colossians 2.16, he says, Therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath day. Uh, let me add 17. Things which were a mere shadow of what is to come, but the substance <clears throat> belongs uh, to Christ. Uh, uh, the, the, you know, we don't, you can't, we can't ever add to the scriptures, nor can we uh, create a situation where, okay, so long as you're doing these things, everything is going to uh, be all right. Uh, because we know we, Jesus is going to accuse the Pharisees in Matthew 23. He, one of the things he calls them is whitewashed tombs. You know, you know, we, they, they look, you know, they, they look good on the outside, but on the inside is full of dead bones. It is actually what he says. But, you know, jumping into the actual text, because uh, time is, is flying. These Pharisees come down, these Pharisees and these scribes uh, come down from Jerusalem. And, you know, that's not the first time that we've uh, seen uh, that happen. You know, they, they came down, you know, when he was speaking in the house in uh, Mark chapter 2. You know, they, they came down to hear him speak. Luke, I believe it's Luke 5 is what uh, is actually what tells us that the, uh, the, the they came down to, to, to hear him because obviously word about Christ uh, was uh, spreading. So they came down from uh, Jerusalem, but their intent is not good. You know, it, it, it's safe to say that Jerusalem, if you will, you know, the religious sort of capital is also the capital of the opposition to Christ. You know, and of course, when he goes to Jerusalem for the final time, you know, is when he's going to have that final conf confrontation, you know, leading to him being crucified and whatnot. But they they come down and they come down with. The intent to find something to accuse him with. They, uh, they, they come down with the. They want to take him down. We, we, we already know that from Mark three six, where they, where the, they were getting together with the Herodians, you know, thinking about how they could destroy him. Uh, but they, they come down, uh, and, and they look and they see something that's happening, but not with Christ. You know, and this is interesting because that that also happened before. As well, because in Mark 2, remember when we talked about the Sabbath, uh, in Mark 2, as he, it, in 23, it says, And it happened that he was passing through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples began to make their way along while picking the heads of grain. The Pharisees were saying to him, Look, why are they doing what's not lawful on the Sabbath? And, and we, talked, uh, we talked about that, how that was uh, their sort of over-interpretation of, of, of the Sabbath. Uh, but it's the same thing here, interestingly. They, they don't actually find any fault with Christ, but they do find fault with the disciples, specifically that they're eating their bread with impure hands. Uh, that is unwashed. Uh, no, this is a bad thing. Uh, and, and Mark gives us the note in verses uh, 3 and 4. He sort of tells us parenthetically that this is something, in, not that it's something that every single Jew does, but... This was a common practice. It was a widespread practice at this time, even if it was not a uh, universal uh, practice. Uh, but, you know, the problem again here, of course, is that there's no biblical command to wash one's hands before a meal, j just a regular meal. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you won't find that. Now, it's true that there that the priest of Israel had to wash their hands and feet in their regular uh, service of the tabernacle. Uh, why do I have that duplicated? Uh, that uh, That's true. It, it's true that both the priest and the layman, when you did, let's say, the peace offering, also known as the fellowship offering, that they, they both had to be clean so that, you know, they, they would have had to have washed th themselves to, to have that offering because that's an offering that's, being offered up to God, so a portion of it goes to God, a portion of it goes to the priest, 
and the rest is going to the individual and it's a it's a joint sort of meal so to speak we, we know that god doesn't actually eat food but where there, there there's fellowship uh going on but you know this again goes way uh beyond that uh again washing hands had become a widespread custom and a sign of piety and fidelity to god uh one sort of letter that was written th this letter sort of describes or purports to describe the how the hebrew bible got translated into greek many years ago it says following the customs of all the jews they washed their hands in the sea in the course of their prayers to god and then proceeded to the reading and application of each point uh, another background commentary said washing their hands removed partial ceremonial impurity picked up in the marketplace hands were apparently immersed up to the wrist or purified by having water poured over them from a pure vessel. The Pharisees also had rules about immersion vessels to remove in uh, purity. So, you know, you, you, you have these stands. And, and again, it, it, it's basically the taking of rules that apply to the priests and imposing those rules and placing those rules on, you know, the common person. Uh, because again, if they, they observe this, you know, they're, they're less likely to do something, you know, that violates the written Torah, violates the written uh, word of God. Uh, and, and it's fine that this wasn't, uh, so this, by the way, let me clarify, this wasn't about hygiene. This, this was about ceremonial purity. Uh, so, and, and again, it's fine if somebody wanted to wash their hands before eating every meal, you know, uh, that, that's fine. That, 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 that's a good thing. It's, but it's wrong to say that you are, you know, you are somehow in some form of sin or acting unholy or don't care about the holiness of God if you happen to be eating food with unwashed hands. Uh, but in verse 5, they say, uh, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat their bread with impure hands? That, that, that's key. Because again, it points to the fact that there's no scriptural violation. And Christ is having none of it. Our Lord responds with what I would call a holy and righteous indignation against him. He said, and he said to them, verse 6, Rightly did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, hmm. as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far away from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the precepts of men. Neglecting the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. Now, Christ is not saying that when Isaiah gave that prophecy in, in Isaiah uh, 29, 13, that Isaiah was directly prophesying of them. Uh, rather, he's saying that those words that Isaiah spoke to his generation, to the leaders of his time, you know, uh, we can rightly take this and say that this is true of you as well. You all are giving me lip service, but you're not actually living right. You know, the word that, I, the word that we get hypocrite from refers to literally a pretender, a play actor, somebody acting uh, or claiming or functioning uh, in a capacity that doesn't actually represent who they are. We we have actors today in plays, uh, in, in movies, and in, in, in various uh, shows. And we know that, you know, those characters that they are putting before us don't actually exist. Uh, unless it's based on a true story. But they're, they're, they're pretending. So Jesus is quite bluntly saying, you know, you all are, don't actually care about honoring God. Uh, you all care more about your, your, your rules that you think are so much better uh, than you do about what the Lord has actually uh, said. You, know, you guys say in doing this that this is something that God would be pleased with, but in fact, it's not actually uh, the case. Uh, and, and to go on and to prove his case and to 
uh, provide sort of the evidence, uh, if you will, that this is uh, not actually the, the case. He actually cites uh, actual scripture and gives an example of how they're uh, defiling it. Uh, do I want to do that? Yes. Now, I, I, it's, I have here, he was also saying to them, you are experts at setting aside the commandments of God in order to keep your, trend, uh, your tradition. Uh, you could also say that uh, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandments of God, or uh, you have a fine way of invalidating God's command, um, uh, so forth, and... Uh, so on. You you neatly reject the commandments of God. Uh, the point is, okay, you you guys are you guys are coming at me. This is sort of Jesus sort of counter attacking. You know, you guys do very well at setting aside God's commands. And he he points out an actual commandment. You know, the the fifth commandment you know, that, that that's given: honor your father and your mother. And he who speaks evil of father or mother is to be put to death. Uh, uh, but you say, if a man says to his father or his mother, whatever I have that would help you is Corbin, that is to say, given to God, you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or his mother, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, you which you have handed down, and you do many things such as that. So, so see what's going on here. The charge against Christ because Jesus as the rabbi, as the leader, as the teacher, he's responsible for the actions of his disciples. So, uh, what they do, in essence, is a reflection on him. Let me just say in passing, that's that actually is... That is actually a true statement, uh, and it's true for us today. Yo, know, you know, God is who He is. Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's uh, the one who has all power in His hands. He's the one who's coming to judge the quick and the dead. He is the one who's far more willing to forgive sin than we are to ask for forgiveness. Amen. Uh, at the same time, and if we um, who name the name of the Lord, who call ourselves Christians, aren't living actually in the manner prescribed in the book. You know, if, if our actions don't line up with what we're saying, then we are giving the watching world a certain image of of God in Christ, or or at or at least uh, you know them room to assume something about God in Christ or. Or at least an, an idea of how we view our relationship with God and Christ that can have an impact on them. You know, no wonder Christ said, let your light shine before men. That they may see your good works and glorify your Father who art uh, in heaven. Uh, you know, that that's why Paul could so strongly go after the church at, at Corinth. Because they were, you know, they were just... Christian liberty, Christian liberty, yeah, we're going to have this, let, allow this man to be sleeping with his stepmother. Christian liberty, Christian liberty, uh, and whatnot. And, you know, which would lead to blasphemy uh, among those unbelievers sort of watching. Because even those around them, it understood, hey, that's not okay. So it is, it is a true and, a, and a, an important point that, uh, you know, what the disciples do does matter um and we do want to keep that in mind sorry i i at that book that point belonged earlier but it, it sort of came to my mind uh now uh but christ brings them an actual attack uh he he brings an actual charge against them and we just read the uh the commandments themselves uh but i'll read them again exodus twenty twelve. The full commandment says, honor your father and your mother that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God uh, gives you. Uh, Deuteronomy 5.16 is almost the same. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God has commanded you that your days may be prolonged and that it may go well with you on the land which the Lord your God gives you. And so serious did the 
so serious was the Lord's, uh, was this commandment, was the Lord's instruction that he commands death for its violation. Exodus 21, 17, Exodus 21, 17 says, He who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Leviticus 20 and 9 says, If there is anyone who curses his father or his mother, he shall surely be put to death. He has cursed his father or his mother. His blood guiltiness is upon him. The Lord took this seriously. Now, this wasn't just some one-time violation. This was, you know, of a little kid. We'd, we'd be talking about a, a, a child who's older, but also there is persistent, sort of sustained... Uh, rebellion, uh, refusal to honor the parents, refusal to o obey uh, the parents, refusal to hold them in one, uh, in the high regard in which they are to be held. Uh, because, quite frankly, if, if a person is not willing to honor their parents, uh, is there anyone that they 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 won't be uh, willing to disrespect? If you're willing to disrespect your you know, assuming loving, caring parents and you're using, you're willing to sort of rebel against them, treat them like as trash, you know, that, that signals a problem with authority that if it's not dealt with, that's going to get you in a lot of trouble. Uh, if you're not going to honor your earthly parents, you're not going to honor uh, the God who uh, created both those parents and you and gave you to uh, those parents. So this was a uh, serious thing. Now, honoring, by, let, let me say this, honoring parents was more than just obedience, by the way. Uh, when we, when I did my study on the Ten Commandments, when we were doing it on Sunday mornings, I, I made the point that it's, you know, to honor one's parents was to esteem them highly. You know, it was to show respect to them. Um, they had an authority that came from God that you were supposed to acknowledge. It, it did include obedience. But, and specifically, applicable to our point here, it also included financially caring for one's parents. You know, when they couldn't care for themselves. You know, in the land, when the Lord blesses you, you know, and you've got plenty of produce and, you know, the, you've got healthy crops and, and whatnot and your parents are older and they can't, you know, they, they can't work the land or, or whatnot or they, they didn't have the resources. You as a parent was supposed to take care of them. Uh... And, you know, e even in Christ's time, th this was understood as a very uh, serious thing. Uh, one tradition, you know, talks about how if you had to beg, uh, so be it. If you had to beg to get the resources to take care of your parents, that's what you needed to do. Uh, because it was that important. One, um, one, uh, one rabbi taught this, or several rabbis taught this. What What is reverence for parents and what is honor? Reverence refers to one who does not sit at his parents' place and does not stand in his parents' place. He does not contradict his parents' opinion and does not judge his parents' disputes. Honor refers to one who feeds his father or mother and gives him or her drink. He clothes him or her and covers him or her and helps him or her to enter and to exit. So th this was something that in Christ's time, you know, you know, a lot of rabbis would have said, yeah, we, we agree with you on the importance of honoring parents. Uh, you, I mean, you really wouldn't have a choice because scripture agrees with it. We, we just read the fifth commandment, but you know, Deuteronomy 27 and 16 says, Cursed is he who dishonors his father or mother, and all the people shall say, Amen. Uh Proverbs 19.26 says, He who assaults his father and drives his mother away is a shameful and disgraceful son. Uh, again, that's Proverbs 19 and 26. You know, in, in the New Testament, Paul will write, uh, But if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety and regard to their own family and make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. And I do believe that is 1 Timothy 5. Uh, yes, 1 Timothy 5, 4. Uh, so th this was a 
an important thing, but uh, the Pharisees uh, were allowing for, in essence, the the parents to be dishonored. And I had here something uh, that I seem to be missing. Let's see. On 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 this grounds of Corbin, which Corbin, as it sort of says, it means given to God. The the idea behind it was, uh, I've set aside these resources uh, to be uh, given to God. Therefore, I can't use them to help you. Uh, it, I, I I I'm sorry. Even though you might you might desperately. Uh, need them, you know, it, it, it would be a great benefit for you to uh, have them. Uh, I can't uh, give them uh, to you. And, you know, at least these Pharisees were saying, yep, yep, that, that, that's good. You know, uh, that, that's right. Yes, vows were important. You know, the Old Testament speaks about sort of making rash vows and it does speak of keeping your vows, but the greater obligation here was to uh, take care of your parents. But Christ is saying, uh, you are allowing that to go by the wayside. So, you know, you all are accusing my disciples of transgression. No, they're, they're not transgressing anything. They're, they're going against these main trade traditions. You all are transgressing the law of God and you're doing so often and yet you think you're doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. you know, this is the folly of legalism. You know, you're, you're doing A and B and C, you know, and, and some of these things might actually uh, be good, uh, but that which is actually pleasing to God is being left by the wayside uh, because your heart is not right. Because you don't actually love honor, respect the God that you claim uh, to do. Uh, and so he says, thus invalidating the word of God by your tradition, which you have handed down, and you do uh, many things such as that. So we don't read sort of what happens after that. He he, he basically, you know, I, I'm sure they, they, they probably went away because he, uh, they try and come after him, and again, he, he turns them back, you know, in front of a crowd, you know, because th th this is not being done uh, in private. You know, they, they gather around him. Uh, so the, the, there are people there, and, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're seeing him, and they, they probably had to go, they probably would said to themselves, okay, we, we got to leave, and we got to regroup. We, we, we got we to gotta do something. Uh, but when they do... Christ calls the crowd again uh, to himself. And he began saying to them, Listen to me, all of you who understand, there is nothing outside the man which can defile him if it goes into him. But the things which proceed out of the man are what defile the man. You know, you know he's, uh, Jesus is making an appointment statement here. He's basically saying, Listen, guys. If you eat food with unwashed hands, uh, that's that's not going to defile you. Frankly, you know, eating food uh, can't defile you in the sense that what what he's going to be getting at it can't defile you sort of spiritually. You know, it uh, it can't defile you in a way that truly matters before the God uh, that you serve. The, the 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 defiling aspect. You know, that which is dangerous uh, is actually that which comes out of you. But that which proceeds out of the heart of man, you know, that is what uh, defiles him. Uh, and then his disciples, the, he, the crowd leaves because, you know, he, he speaks in uh, parables to sort of to the larger crowd. But then often to his disciples he who explained the actual meeting, and so that's what it says here. Uh, his disciples questioned him about the parable, and he said to them, "Are you so lacking in understanding? Also, do you not understand that whatever goes into the man from uh, outside cannot defile him, 
because it does not go into his heart, but into his stomach and is eliminated. Literally, that actually is and goes into the sewer or the latrine. Uh, but the, the, the point is still the same. Thus, he declared all foods clean. We'll come back to that. And he was... Uh, and he was... So, uh, again, the, the, the idea uh, behind here is that it, the, it, the underlying issue is not food being washed with unwashed... Ate, eaten with unwashed hands. Uh, you know, that... You know, that that's not the defiling here. The the defiling here is uh, what comes out of your mouth, you know, what you do, because these things review, view or reveal rather your true spiritual state, uh, and that's the thing that is point, uh, important. And, and Jesus has to make it clear, and he makes it uh, quite clear. Uh, verse nineteen, because oh no, I read that. Verse twenty, and he was saying. That which proceeds out of the man, that is what defiles the man. From from within, out of the heart of man, proceed the evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, and adulteries. Deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. Mm. Let's make it clear. Um, listen, guys, what goes into the stomach goes, what we eat with our mouths goes to our stomachs and not our hearts. You know, our bodies use the good and they expel the bad. The, the real issue is that we have defiled hearts. You know, what truly makes us unclean is inside here. Uh, you know, that. You know, the, the real problem, the real thing that needs to be clean is our hearts. What really needs to be washed is that which is on the inside of us. That is why we need the cleansing blood of Christ. Amen. And the conforming, you know, of the Holy Spirit. You know, as it says in Romans 8, he, he conforms us to the image of uh, the Son. Uh because that, you know, we, we, we list all of these things. There's 13 things that are listed here. And not that these would be present in any particular one or any particular individual. But these are, represent the, the position or the the current state of, of mankind by default. And uh, these are the things that need to be addressed. These are the real problems. Yeah, uh, the the folly of legalism is that it puts the focus on the wrong things. It it puts the focus on doing supposedly uh, the right things while ignoring, you know, uh, the main thing, which is our hearts and relationship to or in relation to uh, the triune God of the universe. If our hearts are not washed, if our hearts are still defiled, again, to use my example from earlier, it doesn't matter what we do. It amounts to nothing. But if our hearts are washed, if we have been cleansed by the blood of Christ, then if we eat, we happen to eat food with unwashed hands, um, you know, that's, that's not a, a, an issue. Uh, like, you know, setting aside sort of questions of hygiene, that in terms of purity, uh, that that that's not an issue. Uh, but that's what he that's what he needed to get the disciples to sort of uh, understand, uh, sort of to keep the main thing the main thing. Uh, now, again, does that mean that we uh, you know, we set aside all tradition or that all traditions are bad or whatnot? No. I found this quote from a Messianic Jewish scholar, um, a, a Jewish believer in Jesus. He, uh, in his commentary, he wrote, his name is David Stern, and he, he wrote this, and, it, and it's quite insightful. It says, a state cannot be run by a constitution without legislation. Uh, uh, in other words, you know, we have the U.S. Constitution, but it, within the Constitution, it empowers the Congress to make laws to promote the general welfare. You know, the, the Constitution uh, sets out sort of in broad terms, uh, things that are to be done and not done, uh, but it's not a 
it's not meant to be a comprehensive document that covers every conceivable sort of situation. Same, same thing actually with the law. Uh, if you look at Exodus 21 through 23, the so-called Book of the Covenant, you're not going to find a detailed, a super detailed law code. Now, there are some specifics given for certain things, and then there are things that would have to be extrapolated. Um, that That's the same point. Uh, that's the same idea here. Likewise, the Jewish nation could not be run by the written Torah alone without the orderly application of it and addition to it implied in the concept of tradition. But just as a country's legislation cannot contradict or supplant its constitution, so true tradition, so too tradition, Jewish, Messianic, Christian, or whatever, cannot violate or alter God's word. Uh, end quote. Uh, uh, in other words, we have a court that will say this law is constitutional or unconstitutional. Uh, you know, that can happen at this with the state Supreme Courts and, and the, of course, the U.S. Uh, Supreme Court. So, you know, they can say, yeah, you passed this law. You might even have to have right to pass this law. Uh, but this law is sort of inconsistent. Um, yes, you know, you, it, it, it makes sense. You know, pre preachers, teachers, what do we do? We take the scripture and we seek to make, to unpack it and to make application of it. That, that's a, that's a necessary function. You know, we, we can envelop, we can develop traditions that, you know, reflect what's sort of done, uh, or reflects the, the commandments of scripture or, or allows us to obey the scripture uh, in a in a God honor in a God honoring way. Of course, uh, if you're actually following the scripture, you're honoring God. But you know that th that's good. Where uh, the problem becomes, where to use the example where I did earlier with the young man, I, and I really think it was snapping his fingers. I think that was the issue where, and he sort of gets his hand slapped, so to speak. You know, he he gets in trouble for uh doing that you know that's that actually wasn't wrong at least not according to anything that's in scripture uh but you know you if you could if you make the person to believe that they've sinned when they've not that that's where the problem uh comes into and that's the folly of these pharisees they they made these traditions a standard of righteousness when the the old testament hadn't done so um you know they became the standard of uh, piety of uh, holiness um, you know they said do these things do these things if you want to be holy or at least claim to be holy you know follow these rules if you want to be right with God mm. Mm. but again these things don't address the real problem Jeremiah 17 9 says the heart is more deceitful than all else and <coughs> is desperately sick <coughs> Or as it says in the King James and New King James, desperately wicked. Who can understand it? Ecclesiastes 9 and 3 says this. This is an evil in all that is done under the sun, that there is one fate for all men. Furthermore, the hearts of the sons of men are full of evil and insanity is in their hearts throughout their lives. Afterwards, they grow to the dead. So the Solomon, the writer of Ecclesiastes, is saying, look, this is something that's endemic to man. That's why true purity starts inward and flows outward. Uh, I was listening to a, 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 a teacher. He was uh, on, as he was going through this same chapter as I was uh, going through. And he talked about, you know, this guy who would, whenever you try and talk to him about Christ, he'd say, yeah, I'm a Christian. And you know, he'd be doing all of these things, doing all of these right things. So finally, Pastor Winger, that's the name of the pastor, he asked him, how's your walk with God going? And this time, the young student, he couldn't just rattle off answers. You know, he, he stuttered and finally he got silent. <clears throat> because he, Pastor Winger asked a different question. How is your walk going? Not... Not, are you a Christian or you think you're a Christian? Okay, how's your walk with God going? And it forced him to consider the actual relationship or lack thereof that he had with God. Uh, that's what matters. I, again, this is why we, you know, you can do all of the right things in the world, but um, 
if your heart is not right, then what Christ is going to say is, depart from me, you do of iniquity, I never knew you. Or you worker of lawlessness, um, I never knew you. You know, when, when the people come and say, did we not feed, um, you know, we, we, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons and whatnot? You know, Matthew 7, you mm. know, that, that's what his response is going to be. Mm. Um, uh, the point, so to, to sum it up, the folly of legalism is it, you know, it, it creates a sort of system of works righteousness where we do the right things, uh, uh, but it leaves out the most important thing, uh, yeah, last night from my Bible reading, I, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, Paul talks about examining yourselves to see that if you're in the faith, you know, if, you, if you pass the test. That's what we need to do. Um, and it's a good thing for even for, for believers to examine their own hearts. You know, you know, a, a, examine their own lives. Am, am I doing this just for the sake of or... You know, because I actually love the Lord for I'm seeking to love the Lord with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Uh, and if not, that's when we go back and say, Lord, forgive me. And he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, that's all I have for you today. Brother, yes. I need a good definition for uh, verse 20. And he said, what comes out of, of man... The words that come out of your that defiles a man. So those. What do they mean by defile? Makes makes them unclean, mm -hmm. makes them unholy, unholy, makes them unfit for the presence of God, uh, unfit for fellowship. Because because remember, you know, part of these tradi these traditions in part are have as their goal or focus making sure that Israel is holy unto the Lord. You know. Uh, making sure that Israel is in right standing with 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 God and and the Old Testament law, you know, you had to be sort of clean to be able to approach the tabernacle. Uh, you had to be. Uh, Numbers chapter five talks about. Hey, listen, it talks about. Listen, these people need to go out the camp. So if they have some type of uh, skin disease, it, the Bible uses leprosy. It's not the leprosy that we know of today, but if they have leprosy or um, if they touched, uh, if they touched a, a dead body, um, if there there were a couple of other there are a couple of other things, but if, if these situations are the case, go outside the camp because they are unclean, you know, not because they've done anything wrong, sort of morally, uh, but there there's a there's there's a ritual uncleanness and and nothing unclean in any way can dwell within. Uh, the presence of God. So, yeah, a leper or someone having an... So, this would be an abnormal discharge. So, th there's something physically wrong or unclean because of a dead person. You had to sort of send them away. I'm looking for that perfect word. Um, that, uh, you know, like when evil thoughts come out of our hearts, it... It's... It defiles, well... Well, it it, it defiles it, it's um it, it's it's unholy unholy uh, I, I guess because that which I uh, for so sort of I, I mean I think defiles it is a good word but that which proceeds out of the man that is that what defiles him what it 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 makes him unfit unfit oh. unfit to be in the presence of God that's, that's good mm -hmm. Yeah, not worthy of. Yes. And fit of the of presence the, of God. Of the presence of God. Right, yo, know, because you know, if if you know, if I'm somebody who, you know, I'm a, uh, I'm a serial thief. I'm a I'm a serial adulterer or a serial fornicator, which is can include all manner of uh, various sort of sexual sins. If I'm someone who traffics in deceit. So I'm constantly deceiving people or or perhaps the easiest one for, for us to get for any of us to get involved with if I'm potentially walking around sort of proud, you know, you know, don't you know who I am? Mm -hmm. You know, you know, I am I'm walking I'm acting in opposition to uh to God uh and to his word. I'm unfit to be in his presence. Amen. Uh, 
I'm um, I'm acting un unworthy, un uh, unholy. Uh, I I'm saying I, you know, I'm acting in such a way that says, Lord, I don't want you, uh, and I'm not going to have you. So I'm unfit. Mm -hmm. Yep. No. I said a good word. I'm not worthy. Yes. Of your presence. Yeah, because that, that that's what happened when they when they someone who was defiled, uh, they had to leave the camp. Why? Because the the tabernacle of God was in the camp. It literally was in the center of the camp. Um, and if somebody was defiled in the camp, well, that could that's something that could be transmitted to the to the tabernacle. That's by the way. That's why on the day of atonement, one of the sacrifices was to purify the tabernacle itself. Um. Because it, it could collect defilement. Because, you know, if someone's defiled and they don't know it and whatnot, that, you know, that sort of pollution collects, uh, and, and that that needs to be dealt with because God is holy, uh, and, and nothing holy can nothing unholy, nothing unclean, nothing defiled, nothing, you know, less than perfect can be in His presence. Nothing unfit. Yes. And be in, in, in his presence. So. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Thank you, brother. Amen. Praise the Lord. Did you hear what happened in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem. Earthquake. That's in Syria. Isn't that in Syria? I, if you, are you talking about the earthquake? Uh, yeah. If you're talking about Syria and Turkey. Um, Turkey, I'm here. Oh, yeah. Turkey and Syria. Yeah. Nights over 10. 12, oh. Over 12,000 people that were dead. Yeah. Well, let's, uh, if all hearts and minds are clear, we'll go ahead and uh, close out. Yeah, there, there was an incident in Jerusalem a few days ago. That, um, uh, some worshipers were actually killed um, as they were sort of worshiping in Jerusalem. I forget where it was, but they I were. Didn't hear that one. They, 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 they were actually killed um, when they weren't actually doing anything wrong. Was it were sacrificing or what? No, they no no. They they don't do literal sacrifices there. At least uh, not, not at this point. But they were, they were worship, they were worshiping. And again, I don't. I I remember hearing about it, but I don't know exactly where they were. If they were in a synagogue, or if they were around where the Temple Mount is, or or whatnot. But they were they were gunned down. Um, oh, so. Okay, they were murdered. Yes, yes. They, they, this wasn't a natural disaster. They they were they were. They were murdered, yes. Yeah, they uh, are horrible. Oh. But, uh, Praise the Lord. Father, we thank you, O oh God. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for the Son, O oh God. <coughs> who We thank you, God, that by the blood of Christ, O oh God, our hearts can be made clean, O oh God. That all defilement, O oh God, and impurity, O oh God, can be uh, washed, O oh God. We thank you, O oh God, that when we are saved, O oh God, that our filthy rags are taken off, O oh God, and we are clothed with the road of robe of Christ and we are covered in his blood. Father help us O oh God so that we we never O oh God seek to rely on O oh God uh, even the breast of traditions O oh God that we always understand O oh God that we have never could never uh, will never earn our salvation O oh God but we we trust in you O oh God and that everything that we do for you O oh God uh, must and should flow O oh God uh, uh, from a heart that, that loves you O oh God even as you said in your word we are uh, created for good works, O oh God, which you have set aside beforehand for, for, for those who love you. Father, write these words upon the tablets of our hearts that we forget them not, but grow in grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray for everyone that is inside of my voice that you keep them from hurt, harm, and danger, going with them and before them, O oh God. Father, we ask your blessing upon this household, O oh God, and every household that is represented here, O oh God. Give us safe travel and mercies and bring us back at the next appointed time. Father, we Thank you. We ask these mighty blessings. In the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.